I'm gonna drive a formula car upside down in a tunnel. But as I said in the last video, we know an F1 car isn't right for project inversion. So this is the story of how we found the perfect car to drive upside down, how we made it produce more downforce than an F1 car, and how we overcame a multitude of design problems, many of which you might not have thought about. A mistake a lot of people use is they'll say, look, at a certain speed, this car would drive upside down on a tunnel. But what they do, the, the, the aerodynamicists will calculate at what speed you will match the mass of the car. Well, that's not even close. That's Willem Toet, Project Inversion's aerodynamicist. He previously worked at Benetton, Ferrari and Sauber F1 teams and has decades of experience in F1 aerodynamics. So there is a lot going on when trying to get this car upside down. And the calculation isn't just as simple as this car weighs 800 kilos and it creates 1000 kilos of downforce. Therefore, it can drive upside down in a tunnel. First, the downforce figures that we hear about with these cars are often in perfect condition. Driving in a perfectly straight line on a perfectly flat piece of track with no change in the car's ride height and with no change in wind. But very little is perfect when driving up the side of a tunnel. We're not driving in a straight line and we have to drive across the curvature in the base of the tunnel. Just think about it, the tunnel is curved below the car, which decreases downforce massively. The car will also be accelerating and decelerating while going over bumps in the tunnel, changing the ride heights of the car and decreasing downforce once again. And of course, this event will be outside in changeable wind conditions. You would have to go to a force that is least, at least twice the mass of the car in aerodynamic downforce so that you get the equivalent of the car trundling along the ground in terms of the amount of grip that you would get. And this is where things would get tricky for an 800 kilogram Formula One car. And that's not even to mention the engine issue. Every Formula One team has looked at this also is aware that an F1 car isn't right. And to be honest, we did look at loads of other options for the car that quite a few of you mentioned in the last video. Motor-wise, a Formula E car would be great. The electric motor can work any way up. However, the Formula E cars in their current configuration are just not set up in terms of weight and downforce for what we need. So how about the Porsche 919 Evo? The car Porsche retired in the best way possible by making it go as fast as possible without the restrictions of rules. And a car I can't talk about without mentioning that time they tried to beat my lap record at Brands Hatch and failed. I should really stop mentioning that, otherwise they might try again. Anyway, the Evo is about 850 kilograms, albeit with 1,160 horsepower and it creates 50% more downforce than the original race car. But with all that weight, it's still going to struggle. So weight is the real issue. What about a Formula 3 or Formula 4 car? Well, F3s are about 670 kilos and F4s are about 570. It's better, but it's still quite heavy and they don't produce all that much downforce. Now, a good option that's light and has a lot of downforce, for its weight anyway, is a Formula student car. Just look at the wings on this, and they usually weigh less than an incredible 200 kilograms. However, it'd be more like I was wearing the car rather than sitting in it. And to be honest, I wouldn't fancy a crash in a former student car. And so we came to the conclusion that a hill climb car was the best option for a base. But before we explain which car we chose, why, and our exact design process, I should reiterate that we made the decision based on the physics of this very specific problem. This project has been worked on by some of the best minds in engineering, physics, and maths. And if you want to get started in any of those fields, as well as loads of others, you should check out today's sponsor, brilliant.org. Look at this, it's fellow YouTuber Real Engineering's course on Brilliant, and there are a load of lessons that apply to this project. This lesson is on centripetal motion, as well as material limits, because of course, we wanna get that stuff right. And Brilliant do this best, because they break it down into small, bite-sized chunks that you can do anywhere. So you can be learning in your downtime, even on your commute. They have thousands of visual lessons that enable you to learn by doing. From foundational and advanced math, Maths to AI, data science, real engineering, and more, with new lessons added monthly. Try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days. Visit brilliant.org forward slash driver61 or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and the rest of our upcoming series all about project inversion. But why does Hill Climb produce race cars that are fast, light and have loads of downforce? Well, Hill Climb is really a playground for engineers and aerodynamicists. There is no minimum weight, no maximum engine capacity or horsepower. 
the aerodynamic rules are simple. You have to have a certain ground clearance. Um, you are allowed wings and bodywork that's relatively wide. So you have that sort of freedom, but you also have far more freedom dimensionally and where you can put things. So, for example, the aerodynamics of this hill climb car, already before we started work, were, was creating a similar amount of downforce, a little bit less than Formula One, but much more efficient than Formula One. But is it really possible for these little cars to create a significant amount of downforce? Well, Willem thinks so. We can relatively easily, because of different rules, create something that, despite being a much lighter car, has more downforce than a Formula One car would have at the same speed. And this is the key, peak downforce at a lower speed. I'm gonna outline the costs in a later video, but the bulk of the cost of this project is in building the tunnel. If we used an F1 car, the tunnel would need to be very long and would easily cost multiple tens of millions of pounds or dollars. And as it turns out, our hill climb car, the Empire Wraith, could do the job of doubling its mass in downforce quite easily. But Willem, being an engineer, wanted to push things further and save us some sponsorship money on building the tunnel. So here's Willem to explain how fast we'll need to go to drive upside down. So at first it would have been 100 mile an hour to double the downforce, and we've got it down well below 80 miles an hour. And that's with all the safety margin required. So only 80 miles per hour, that's absolutely wild. And of course, the speed is not only important for the length of the tunnel, but important when considering what happens if things go wrong. Of course, it's much better to have an upside down crash at 80 miles an hour rather than 150. So what did Willem's design process for this really crazy project actually look like? And this is really interesting, and you should see the final car. I think we did 38 configurations, but I did five attitudes for every configuration. That's 38 different iterations of the car's design. And for each of those 38 different designs, the car ran in five different attitudes in CFD, because it's no good just understanding how the car behaves in perfect conditions. You need to know what happens when the car is in a tunnel, when there's a crosswind, when there's a ride height change, and when the car's turning. You need to understand what happens in the worst case scenario. Because if not, we'll have a big crash. So it's fair to say Willem has done all of his homework and a bit more, and used all of his decades of F1 and aerodynamic experience. He's left no stone unturned. We actually recorded a podcast with him all about project inversion and how he went about designing this car. Check that out on the Driver61 podcast just up here. So here's the car. Doesn't it look absolutely wild? It looks like what I'd have made if drawing an F1 car from memory when I was seven. Wings, wings, big diffuser, and a load of camber. All the best things about a formula car. So it may not look completely conventional, but it has to perform. And Willem's right. We need pure performance from this car. Just look at that camber. It's a bit weird, right? Well, I'll explain that a bit later. But first, the diffuser. It uses ground effect and it is massive. But there is a problem in this case with using the floor for downforce. A modern F1 car will get much of its downforce from the car's floor and how it interacts with a nice, smooth race circuit. But the tunnel and its curved floor brings us an issue. Imagine the car sat in the curve and think about the gap between the middle of the diffuser and the tunnel underneath. Because it's curved, the gap has grown a lot compared to a normal racetrack. That would mean a, an effective increase in ride out of 50 millimeters if you just average the difference over the, over the entire area. And to be honest, that's the least of our problems. When the car turns, which it has to do to transition up the tunnel, things get a bit weird. But the really big challenge is getting there because of the angle you have to go relative to the tunnel. So the That's your... the really big, the your angle, precisely. Okay. So basically, as you turn across the tunnel to get up the side and onto the ceiling, the car's ride heights change vastly. In fact, the inside tire comes off the ground by about 10 centimeters. Obviously, this isn't great for aero, but it's also terrible for the mechanical grip. Typically, when a tire is not in contact with a track, it is suboptimal. And things get even more dangerous. You might think the most dangerous part is when the car is traveling fully upside down. But unfortunately, it's not. 135 yeah. degrees, something like that. Most of the way up to yeah, being you're inverted. You're a fair way up. You've got downforce pushing you up, but you've also got a big peeling moment. You've got much more force on these lower wheels. Gravity's pull, pulling pulling this way, yeah? So gravity's acting on the central gravity of the car, 
and then you've got a contact here and here and then so the important contact is that outer edge and gravity is trying to do that to your car. So this is where I'm most likely to have a crash. The part where I'm turning and driving across the tunnel, where gravity is fighting me and the car and where downforce is at its weakest. This is the danger zone. And because of the significant changes in ride height, Willem actually decided to focus on overbody downforce, the wings, as these are less affected by the ride height changes. So just look at the rear wing, five huge elements and two extra wing sections on the side. And it may just look like they're stuck on the side, but there is a lot more to it than that. So the two pieces on the outside edge of the, of the, of the conventional end plate, let's say, they see air that is being drawn down behind the rear wheels. So you've got these massive rear wheels and air sort of naturally will just flow over them. And you put them in the area above the wake of the wheels, but in an area where the flow is going downwards and with a relatively low angle of attack on the on what looks like a low angle of attack on the wing, you're turning the air a lot because because otherwise it would just be filling the void behind the car. So they have a fair bit of drag, but they, but they have a lot of performance and the efficiency of them is much better than you might Think. So Willem's using the flow over the rear tyres and its energy to create a load more downforce. He's also added some other parts that aren't legal in most motorsports, but we can use here. For example, the skirts. Front wing is also extremely deep and runs quite close to the ground, again making use of ground effect. So it seems like Willem has everything covered. Aerodynamically, I'm completely confident that this is feasible. But what happens if things do go wrong? Well, in the podcast, I jokingly had a question. What happens if you have a monumental shunt? So in, in my cartoon brain, and as a driver being very optimistic, and you can correct me here, Willem, I'm just imagining that if the worst happens, it just peels away gently, and we just gradually float down to the ground, have a nice slow crash. Is that right? <laughs> but to my surprise, that isn't what happens. One of the reasons why, with it together in discussions, we agreed on the seven and a half meter diameter pipe, or radius pipe, um, you don't want a massive distance to come to the ground. Of course, safety is a massive concern, but we do feel like we have everything covered. Willem has allowed for some extra weight in the car for safety components, such as crash structures, a halo, and more strength on the roll hoop. All things that you'd expect. Because if you start upside down, you've got a bigger chance that you're going to end up upside down if it's all, if all, if it's all symmetrical. So why does the car have so much camber? Well, first to fit it in the curvature of the tunnel. The floor is curved and so the wheels need to match this with more camber. And you need to spread the load of the car and its downforce across the entire tire. More importantly, we need to ensure everything is optimal in that danger zone. To optimize for your worst condition and your worst condition is going to be your 145 degrees and then you want the maximum contact area on the tires then. And that's why you redesign the car to have a much higher camber angle that suits the curvature of the tunnel you've chosen. If you haven't yet watched the launch video for Project Inversion, you should do it now. It lays out the entire project. Just watch that here. And if you haven't subscribed, please do it now. It'll really help us raise sponsorship for this crazy project. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.